Hey, welcome to episode five of the Triunity series. I'm Randy Moggins from OffPlanetRadio.com. And our presenter, as always, is Dr. Shamil Asher, and he is here with us. Um, on the heels of all the other things we have done in a recent series, this is probably one of the most critical aspects because we're going to go into what is called the false heaven matrix or complex. What is happening to us in these interim periods between lives? And, you know, we probably need to go into maybe a little bit about proofs for uh, why we believe there is reincarnation, uh, although not from the Eastern model specifically. And so with that, we welcome back Dr. Shamil Asher. Welcome, my friend. Thanks, Randy. Glad to be here again. So you heard my intro there, and uh, maybe as a preface to all this, because we're going to talk about near-death experiences, and we're going to talk about the uh, the false heaven matrix and, you know, what is effectively happening to the soul at death when it's when it's pulled out and then sort of blank slated and we get dropped back in. And we covered a little bit of this in the last show. Um, we kind of did a brush against it, but I think it would be good to now break it out in depth a little bit more. So the, based on the near-death experiences and the research you've done, um, and even in the reading of these ancient texts, what reasons do we have to believe that the most Christians and Hebrews, if you know, most Christians and Jews believe in uh, one life, one death. Christians believe that because of certain false doctrines dropped into their books. Um, different sects of Judaism seem to, if they believe in an afterlife at all, believe that um, it is a one-shot deal. Right. Um... Well, the Christians do. Like, well, like we touched on before, if they go back into their own history, especially with uh, Origen, who, who wrote like, what, 6,000 treaties on, on such things and, and was basically burned alive because of it, uh, they'll find that it, it, it was very heavily in, in the original Christian uh, dogma. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, why do we believe it? I... I, I, I <laughs> I, I think they believe because there's a lot of evidence uh, on a pretty consistent basis. Uh, even today, like I, I do point out in the book, uh, we have so many thousands all the time of these children who are remembering past parts of past lives, but they're never <clears throat> important parts. <clears throat> Just that they're that they've been alive, who they were where they were, things like that, which is amazing. I mean, you know, that is that is amazing to most people, but uh, not in the context that, <clears throat> excuse me, the past life experience people or the subjects uh, are are citing in, in the many thousands of the, uh, I, I guess maybe also in the near-death experiences, but really the past life regression studies and their subjects, uh, which are just so many now, the probability completely defies uh, any and, and it being fake. Um, they that they are uh, going back and and they're giving us uh, a lot of details uh, of what they went through while in that false heaven matrix, which I, I tend to also call the uh, the heaven way station. Uh, or, or like they are really the the best way that I found uh, to uh, put this in your in your head to understand it uh, for for all those uh, people that like shows like Star Trek and things like that. Uh, if you've watched Battlestar Galactica, they had the the Cylons had uh, the resurrection ship, uh, which they all died. Their soul got uploaded back to a resurrection ship and then into a new body and then boom reborn so uh, this is really an amazing thing in our <clears throat> in, in our alleged fiction uh, that is showing us the same thing and um, you know wh when you when I go back and um, like I did uh, in this new book and and I go into that whole Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is a second creation and things like that. There's there's a a, gr a greater, deeper importance for all that 
um, not just to show the text and what they say literally and things like that, but for people to understand uh, different things and connect it forward. Like I remember, if you just take into account <clears throat> um, Genesis 1, right, and, and then you have the, the, the light that was created, right? But you have to wonder um, when this creation, this particular one out of many, was created. Um, we can only speak about this one because this is where we are. Uh, the the light that 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 must have been surrounding it at that time, before the souls here decided to to follow another voice to another mountain for another law, um, and side with the archons. Thus, the original light dissipated; it was gone. Right, which I find, uh, which I in later years found interesting because uh, a friend of mine. Um, in, in Billings here, who's um, a Baptist pastor, um, not really, really great guy, and and he he asked me about that um, the Genesis one text a long time ago because he was piecing something together. Um, he you know he had this whole prophetic idea based on a lot of New Testament texts that everything would come full circle. Um, and he was basing it on the text. I think we even touched on this in the earlier show where we were talking about uh, a new heaven, a new earth, which actually the Hebrew would be renewed, not new, but renewed heaven, renewed earth, which, again, makes more sense in, in, within the context of this being a reformatted um, creation. Because if it's, if it's been taken over, all right, uh, it's got usurpers, which took it over, by our consent, and we have been reformatting it ever since uh, for their own gain, then at the end, uh, if we're to be saved from this, uh, and as I think the New Testament texts also say, which I heard from this particular uh, pastor, uh, that uh, that I found also interesting, which, which was something somewhere in those texts, which you might know, Randy, where it is, <clears throat> he said that the, all the captives would be freed. And I found that so uh, amazing because um, that's exactly really what we've become. The souls have become captives in the physicality. Uh, and he didn't know that. He didn't understand that at that time. He was thinking of it in a very Christian way. But then he went on to tell me that that we have you know a new heaven and a new earth and that at that time there'll be no sun. And I thought, I said, no sun? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I've heard this before. Um, right, and he's, you know, he's... Well, that's no actually, song. actually what you're talking about there, set the captives free. Um, that goes back to Isaiah 61. And then right. there is a, um, I believe it's in Revelation chapter 22, where it then picks up and it says that uh, he will be the son. You know, which I guess refers to Yeshua, the Messiah, and the ascended souls themselves. So there is this kind of, you know, it's not definitive, but yeah, we've looked at this before because, because Revelation chapter 22 in the last verses looks an awful lot like it's pointing to a U-turn back to Eden, back to the Edenic world right. pre-fall, so-called. Right, which I, I fully identify with. Yeah. It's a circular it's a circular motion and it's finished and uh you know, renewed again. So that I am totally on board with because it works with pretty much any either scientific or uh, if you want to call it religious paradigm, so or, or spiritual paradigm. And and um uh, so that, yeah, he was uh, yeah exactly. All the New Testament stuff comes from uh, it comes from the, the prophets usually, you know, like you say Isaiah sixty one. So uh, so he was going into that saying that that was in the New Testament, and I found that interesting <clears throat> that uh, the, the, this would that there would be uh, some light, some uh, God's light would 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 light up everything, okay, and and that there would be no more sun. And I thought, well, that's very interesting because that goes back to how I understand uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, 2 being the, the beginning of the reformation process where you have now the creation of a sun and the creation of stars. 
Now, to to just dispel the uh, the myth that the moon was created in the second creation story in Genesis two, that was not. If if people want to go by uh, the, the literal text, if they want to believe that, then the literal Hebrew text do not say anything about a moon being created there. It says the greater light, which is the sun, and the lesser light, and it, and it says the stars in the Hebrew. It does not say the moon and the stars. That was added. So that was in kind of Hebrew. referring to, so instead of the moon, that's actually referring to the firmament and the bodies that are set in place in the firmament. Right. And, and uh, But again, I contest that um, <clears throat> the sun, regardless, and the moon, and the, moon, and the stars... Um, being created by whoever, all right, adding them to, you know, what could easily be understood as, you know, a dome. So they're not actually out there. Right. You can't actually go. You can't actually go to them. So um, if they're adding them, they we the one thing we do know. I always I always redact it. I always go back to what we absolutely do know and. What we do know is uh, very prominent throughout history is that this, the sun, the moon, and the stars have been used uh, pretty much since the beginning and perpetuated uh, as an ongoing reformation process through religion. You know, they, they, they've been used to create religion narratives and perpetuate cre- uh, religion narratives, and, and not only that, but uh, calendar, calendars and different types of calendars, and also which are infused with religion narratives that take everything off course. So, you know, I have to look at that too as well. When I when I look at all this, like you can't leave that out. You can't you can't leave the effects out of 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 when something's instituted. You can't leave the effects out. The effects are not just effects because they're probably effects from something that was instituted on purpose to create those effects. So th- you have to think of it that way. It, it's not just happenstance, in other words. So, you know, when we look at that, the the moon and the sun, and um, uh, and then I also look at it like 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 I just said, they're not real. No one walked on the moon, so you know there's no astronauts. They're they're astronauts. Uh, you know, they're, they're... <laughs> hey, by the way, to just to drop in a complete non sequitur here, have you heard this stuff? Okay, so I'll I'll bring you back to the no sun, no moon thing in a minute. About Buzz Aldrin being airlifted from Antarctica? Yeah, uh, yeah. Lightyear gets uh, airlifted from Antarctica, blah, blah, blah. blah no, 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 no. And here's the thing, because we noted this before. Um, right before the election, and I think we talked about this, right before the election, Secretary of State John Kerry goes to mm-hmm. the South Pole. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like, what, is this like a tourist attraction for the elites, or... Is there something down there that they're going to tap into? Is there that, that, I don't know. But, I mean, we all agree, those of us who hold this, this, this construct, that Antarctica is um, not a continent. And mm-hmm. so they seem to be going to a central point somewhere uh, south of New Zealand for this. And... Aldrin's down there. He gets airlifted out because apparently he has altitude sickness. This is actually the, the second evacuation. It was an earlier emergency evacuation from Antarctica. So, you know, just tossing this out to the listeners, you got to ask yourself what they're doing going down there. I mean, this guy's, what is he? He's like 84 years old or something. He, that's pretty rugged terrain down there. So I just thought I'd drop that in. Well, I did find I didn't. It wasn't lost on me. I did. I did hear that, and I thought that was interesting. And I think you know maybe they're just sending their most notable people uh, down to talk to the guardians or something, or whoever is in charge of uh, guaranteeing free will moves forward on the planet. I don't know. You know, that's it, it, that's what that's kind of what I got out of that Carrie story. <clears throat> um, from a couple of different uh, things that people sent me that I read, uh, it sounded a lot like there's some guardians, or what, what do we call them, the <clears throat> the watchers. Right, yeah. And, you know, maybe they're, 
They, uh, it said that Carrie went there to, uh, you know, ask them for help because they were getting their asses beat by the other side or whatever you want to call it. And, and they, they got really mad and allegedly. Now, I don't know how they know any of this. You know, well, some of this all. goes back to the Book of Enoch and some of the descriptions that are in the Book of Enoch that we kind of connect to Antarctica as well. Um, right, and which, which you know, my brain goes, it's it's immediately assimilating that information in that context. Yeah, not yeah, in, yeah. You know, so when I'm when I'm reading this stuff, I'm immediately remembering everything I know, and and putting it together, and and you know, that might be right or wrong. I, I you know, it's 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 just what I do, and because to me, right or wrong, it doesn't really matter because none of this is changing anything for me. Uh, but it's you know, it's a uh, entertainment at best. Uh, but yeah, it is entertainment. It's it's kind of to me it's commentary on how ludicrous it all is. Which brings us back to right. the whole thing about the astronauts, and, and that's what triggered the Buzz Aldrin thing there. But that um, basically what's said in the firmament above us: these are not other worlds. It's not space. It is simply that which is inside of, of this, this, um, well, this holographic projection inside of a bubble. Right. So, um, which is important to this subject because yes. uh, that we're going into because the, the moon, uh, which is the alleged, you know, when you go into uh, any of the history of, of mankind, uh, the moon is, is alleged to be... Uh, the soul attraction, soul catcher, soul recovery object um, in, in a, from a, a lot of different peoples around, around the uh, earth and in, on the earth and in, in, through different times. So I find that interesting that in their folklore, you know, you have the, the moon <clears throat> being the soul sucker, in other words. And, and you know, here's another thing that's, that's interesting. Uh, on this, about two years ago, I uh, someone sent me a video with John Lear. You know who he is? Uh, he, his father worked for, I believe, he was a big wig at Northrop and uh, yeah. he used to yep. do the, the Lear jet and all that. So his son, John Lear, who was also a, a pilot, test pilot, and all right. that, or skunk works and all that kind of good stuff. John Lear, you know, again, is this this information? I found it really odd. But here you have this guy sitting there, and he's explaining uh, a whole bunch of different stuff about things. But towards the end of the video, which I think is what this person wanted me to see, um, he goes into how the moon is hollow, that it's filled with this particular kind of uh, high technology left there for a long time ago, blah, blah, blah. And that what this technology does <clears throat> is it recovers souls. It stops them from getting out any further, stops them from getting away, escaping, and then returns them. And, you know, I had to rewind that a few times to listen to it because I couldn't believe it. Here's this guy saying this. But, you know, when you go into ancient folklore that's what people believe that's why there's the moon is used so much in in, in religion and in calendars and, and whatnot which it shouldn't even be used in a calendar but and uh so that's one belief and that's important for this because it's not really there it's not a spherical object that you can go stand on uh i i don't believe it is anyway so uh, then and then you have the Egyptians, right? The Egyptians believed that the, the sun pretty much did the same thing, right? That the, if you were good or you are righteous, that uh, you would go to the sun. And that's interesting as well, because when you get into, like, I think we talked about this a little bit uh, in one of the earlier episodes that we were talking. Uh, I, I mentioned that the Buddhists in the Book of the Dead uh, mentioned that there are two lights uh, that the soul can go to, and that you should not go to the one on the left, I believe is how they... They put it, which I believe would be the moon. So, it there there it is again. It's it's that narrative, <clears throat> that understanding for from people uh, keeps going. And and I guess the Buddhists, they're you know the the hardcore ones, spend their, most of their life learning and practicing to die, to die uh, with uh, being aware uh, that they're dying and 
so that they're aware when the soul separates, so that they're aware and cognitive and remember what they've learned, what they've assimilated, what they've reassimilated, which they believe to be true information rather than the false narrative information, just like I teach. Okay, and so they can go to the other light, <clears throat> which again is it's all pretty interesting stuff. But for our discussion, you know, the false heaven matrix then um, is a, probably a technology-based system, uh, a, a technology-based system that mimics the, the true heaven above, you know, using the moon's light as the initial attraction, you know, to their to their tunnel. And in the light tunnel, uh, with that, all these near-death experience people and uh, subjects and, 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 and past life regression subjects and even some out-of-body experience people, uh, all tend to say the same thing that it that this this must be the thing that transports the soul to, to, to some kind of resurrection ship like we're talking about or as I say in the book it's it's a false heaven way station uh, construct you know which is where the rest of their curriculum is undertaken uh, by all the souls and the curriculum is really kind of where we're starting today uh, to kind of break out um, the people, uh, how I put it in the book, you know, the, the eight points, I think, uh, that are in the book uh, of where it starts and, and what each point is, because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing when you really look at the whole thing and you read all these or listen to the recorded versions or the, the transcripts of what these past, especially the past life ex, uh, regression subjects uh, tend to say and of course I haven't listened to all of them and you know they're they're ongoing but uh, they 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 all it's just a, a huge amount of it has to be 75% of them uh seems to be uh giving back the same information what I find so amazing is these pe these people have no connection there's no connection there's no geographical connection there's there's no you know all this all all the way these guys are doing it um or they're doing it in very um uh, scientific now they're doing you know they have been doing it in a very scientific manner um, procedures and, and and not leading anyone and and you know like I think people used to say well they're they're leading the questions and they're lead but now they've <clears throat> really broken this stuff down so you know I'm, I'm impressed with it and I'm kind of hard to impress with this kind of stuff so they they seem to have that stuff down so the information coming out which a lot of it seems abstract to uh, the researchers, which you know, when you hear, when you read what they're saying back, you know, or what they're, what they're, what you're trying to extract after what these people are saying, you know, these different things, uh, they're trying to extract more information. Say, well, what do you mean by that? Or what, what does it look like? You know, and, and they're not understanding a lot of this because they don't have, say, someone like me sitting next to them. And or after the fact, saying, well, this is probably what they're seeing. This is probably what they're talk about to, to have that extra added information to couple it all together uh so maybe hopefully if they hear this you know your broadcasts or they read the book they'll they'll, they'll maybe get cued by some of this but if you if you if you want i'll just go through the, the first the first eight eight points here and you know to kind of start it off to, if you want yeah absolutely let's go ahead and do that because this kind of cuts to the quick of the matter yeah, so uh, very quickly, just to kind of keep it quick, the, the, the first point uh, would be the observation when, when, in other words, when this is prefaced on the fact that when on, on this, the scenario of the uh, a person's death and the soul separating from the body, right? And this is through the eyes uh, or the memories of the past life regression subjects that you can find. Um, so number one would be the observation of the light and their immediate capture within the light tunnel, All right? And number two would be pre they're presented with a, which, what I call in the book a soul greeter, All right? You might call it a receiver, All right? So number two, they're presented with a soul greeter. Number, greeter. number three, uh, they're given a past life review, you know, whether they want to or not, it seems. Uh, number four... Uh, they're made to take what they call soul classes, which 
was new to me. I found to be very odd, but I go into more detail yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just like, okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, you reviewed your life. Now we're going to take soul classes. Okay. and Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's you're, odd. And you're not going to remember any of this on the other side, by the way. Right. Is, and as you'll see, as you, as you know, and as people will see as they go through the book, that memory loss is what I use as the absolute proof. Yep. A lot of the stuff that we can find or that, that I'm putting forth in this hypothesis in the book, uh, which is, you know, from what I've read and seen, probably the most... You know the the, the the most full hypothesis I've seen uh, that brings all this together. I agree, because I've been you know, studying this stuff for for you know probably seven or eight years since the concept came into view, and while I've seen a couple other people comment and even write about this, because I have one other book that goes into this. Um, it's nowhere near as complete in understanding the mechanisms of the whole thing. So, yeah, please proceed. So the so number four, like I say, would be they're made to say take these soul classes. Number five is they seem to be meeting or made to meet their uh, and and from there on continue through this curriculum uh, with their soul guides. And number six. Uh, it seems at some point these people are saying that they're meeting with a council of elders, which also, let me throw this in there, uh, I put in a book, uh, which I, th I believe occurred last year, an Israeli kid, um, young teenager, uh, got really ill, passed away, uh, came back, went to the hospital, they brought him back, and then he had this big story to tell. So. And in the book, I go through the actual um, transcript. I actually printed the transcript of the story that was given live at his yeshiva with the, the, the rabbi there um, and telling everybody what happened. And in that story, you will see that he met with a council of elders. And you will see that the entire story, the entire experience was as I say in this book, as I express and, and prove throughout, is, is tailored specifically for the soul and what the soul assimilated in that life. So that's a, an important point, the Council of Elders. So then number seven, uh, that each soul is told that they can stay indefinitely, which is interesting because it's contrast. It's, it's, it's <laughs> from number eight. Because uh, I put down for, for number, the, the main thing for number eight is that the eventually each soul is guilted into being forced to a return trip, which obviously is in conflict with number seven. So as I, you know, posit in the book that uh, the soul separation experience, you know, while inside their heaven way station or resurrection ship, whatever you want to call it, uh, is is most often based on the same path of narratives that the person previously held or assimilated in life. You know, so, you know, i.e. the souls, you know, all, when they're, while they're moving through this, are provided the experience that they personally expect to experience, you know, total love, total equality, perfection, you know, the entire time, uh, seeing the people they expect to see, uh, religious narratives, whether it's based on religious narratives or the lack of a narrative, uh, however it is, uh, the, uh, the formula is the same. What changes is the circumstances, the the uh, you know the the surface tension changes a bit. But that's that's really about it. Um, and uh, so that each one is made to feel and uh, what they expect to feel. Or experience while, you know, in that condition. And another point that I think is important to point out is that all of these, most of these past life uh, regression uh, subjects uh, say that, you know, while they're in that tunnel, that they experience, you know, all, all these great feelings of love and perfection and equality, and they believe it's God, and 
you know, all this. And, of course, these souls, you have to remember, once separated from this body, which is what is created to assimilate the narratives, all right, because the DNA was created to then record it and transmit it to the soul, all right, thus polluting the soul, so that when the soul separates from the body, the polluted soul then has the memories, this information, extracted for use later. It's it's a really simple and perfect system as, as far as how it works. But what there's what um, the, the bottom line is that the, the, our souls are out of our bodies are probably still to some extent pretty naive, you know, and and in their true form. Uh, outside of the body and away from this the corrupted body, um, the soul uh, emits uh, the character of the one who created. Remember, I, I always say that the, uh, he's the macrocosm soul, and we are all microcosm yeah. portions from his soul. Thus, we it, it isn't do it isn't. There's no question. Does a soul? emit the character of the creator there's no question it has to it, it can only emit the character of the one who created it uh you know on a much lesser level but much like uh, a, a child that uh, emits the character of the one who created it right uh so uh to to a large extent now of course the, their own soul has a lot to do with that but there's still quite a bit of influence from the from the physical imprint of the parents, uh, so it's it, on a much lesser level. It's the same idea, and and so uh, if 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 we outside of our body are, are are emitting that character of the one who created us, I guess my point is that it, it's an important point that it's the archons are not the ones who are creating. Uh, what those souls, what our souls are feeling while in that system. It's the living souls creating it for them. They're, they're just using it against us. You understand? So, all right, let, let's just think of it like this. You pass away. Your soul doesn't assimilate the correct information. You're like a fish. You go towards the shiny thing. You get sucked into the tunnel. The tunnel is just a giant technology which then uh, takes the good light and perfection and love that your soul is is emitting uh, and amplifies it a million times and then uh, reflects it back. And that's what you're feeling. You're feeling your own output thinking it's something else because they're allowing you to think it's something else because you've already consented to going in. And that's, well, that's essentially... That, that's essentially how I view most of what is called spirituality on this planet, certainly through the religious systems. You know, people, people keep looking for an external rather than internal experience. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, so, so really, I guess to boil it down, uh, I would say that no matter how real this false heaven matrix feels to the multitudes of near-death experience and past life regression subjects, you know, who are reiterating it back, or if souls go through it again, uh, they're not feeling the love, the perfect love and uh, equality and perfection uh, because the eternal, the true eternal creator's presence is literally there. He's not there helping the archons. <laughs> you know, it's it's merely a holographic design matrix invented, you know, and formed to, to play the arrangements that each soul has been programmed through the narratives to expect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after they've been immersed and infused with the false narratives systems that are put here in place for that reason. So each soul is polluted below on earth, through this body, in this corrupted body, in order, which I call the Trinity Six body, right? So so each soul is, is then polluted below through life uh, in order for the previously assimilated narrative data to be pulled out of, of each soul and used against us while 
you know, on the resurrection ship uh, going through their curriculum uh, of, of whatever that is. And, you know, when you look at the stuff that uh, Dr. Richard Martini and Dr. Bruce Grayson from their institutes, they have you know, near-death institutes, uh, I think a lot of that's, you know, you can still get a lot of that stuff uh, and, and read uh, on all this stuff, but it, it's, you have so many thousands of past life regression people who are, you know, recorded and, you know, expressing this stuff. And, and you know, one amazing thing that I wrote in a book, I think, uh, the subtitled, I Want to Go Home, that really hit me. And that was another proof to me. Uh, when, when I read that over and over and over, that, that, that they have these past life regression people you know, okay, they're they're walking them through. They're telling, okay, I'm through the tunnel, and they're making me take. Now, most of them say that they're forced to take this path. Some of them actually say, uh, reiterating to 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 the researcher that uh, while under that they are not consenting, that they don't want. They're saying, I I'm not going to take the uh, the life review, and uh, eventually, very quickly, they're forced to do it. Um, and, you know, so, you know, at first I thought, well, wow, how, how can that be? How can they be forced to do that? If they're, they're, they're outwardly unconsenting at that point, after they saw their soul greeter and after they got sucked through the tunnel of love, you know, and, and they're standing wherever they got to stand in front of a giant screen, flat, flat LED screen, whatever, and they got to watch their past life and, see how they hurt everyone and, and all this stuff, um, which, again, I believe the, the Christian dogma has the same thing in it, doesn't it? Don't they have something that, that when, you know, you go to heaven and you get through those pearly gates and, and you know, and then you're going to see everything that you've ever done? Uh, they, don't they have a past life review kind of process in Christianity, in that dogma? It's there. Um, it's in the book of Revelation. But it, what it what it effectively is, it's the white throne judgment, which theoretically exempts those who are, you know, quote unquote, saved. But yeah, I mean, it's there. It's well, then who of, goes through it? And that's that's not real clear either in the scriptures. Uh, although yeah. you know, it does seem to be the unrighteous. Yeah, of course, of course, it's not clear. <laughs> <laughs> But, but this is, okay, so now we found it. Now we know what it is. So the, the Christian dogma has picked up on this. And you have these past life regression subjects telling you that they're being forced to go through this, which I found pretty interesting. And, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, how can they be forced? Because, okay, there is free will. I don't care where you are. Your soul has free will. So they can't force you. You have to consent. You have to consent, but, you know, I was thinking about it, and it just hit me. They've already consented. Mm -hmm. your, your soul flies, okay? You did not assimilate the correct information. You're polluted. And, you know, one of your ailerons is broken, and you're kind of, like, tilting left. It was like... Yeah, it was like something I was explaining to somebody a few days ago about principles and law <clears throat> uh, and consent. And a lot of people don't understand there's explicit consent and there's tacit consent, which is I, passive I, consent, which is you have not done due diligence in a matter. And therefore, because of the holes in a contract or holes in, a, in an agreement, you've effectively signed off on some other clause or basis. In other words, right. you know, it's like in the scriptures it says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Well, that's true. If you don't read the contract, if you don't understand the terms and conditions, yeah, you. so we are. We're, we're signed on to a whole bunch of stuff we don't think we even know about because we haven't really looked into it. Right, and our souls are, uh, even in life, every life, we do the same thing. We constantly are signing things that we don't know and and don't understand and it's ridiculous and we're consenting to all kind of stuff so i was i was thinking about this and contemplating on how these many are saying that they're forced to do this because that wasn't sitting with me and but i i couldn't just 
you know, slough it off as being BS, that it was just some figment of the thousands of people's same imagine, you know, collective imagination. So because the numbers ring true to me, there's too many thousands of them that have been scientifically regressed. And, I, you know, if there was 10, 20, 50, and even 100, I, I, could, I could sit back and say, ah, you know, maybe they're being led. Maybe, they're, But now you have separate guys doing it. You have separate institutes. They're doing it scientifically. There's 10,000 in this one, 7,000 from that guy. I mean, come on. The, the, at some point, the numbers go the other way. Just say, it's not. It's not possible. There's something here. So, I, that wouldn't allow me to just blow it off and move on. I really had to contemplate on it, and it just and it hit me uh, a day or so later that think about it. You know, something just said, think about it. what's happening. They're leaving. They're going up. They're seeing a light. They're moving towards it. That's consent. But the real consent is that soul greeter. That soul greeter is the real consent. That soul greeter is put there to usher you in the rest of the way, as I explained in the book. And guess what? You don't have to consent to that. But they do. You know, this, is, this once, reminds me a lot of years and years and years ago. I remember talking to somebody back when we had the draft, and they said, you know, People went into Vietnam and they volunteered. And I went, but they were drafted. And he said, no, because each draftee going into induction was basically required to stand on a line and one by one step forward. And it, this sounds a lot like that. In other words, there's a point at which you do a single gesture or movement that basically commits you to a process through this, this, you know, express or tacit approval. As above, so below. Exactly. The, the same exact subject, the same exact systems are above as below. So, so I thought about it, and basically what you're seeing is you're, you're, the soul is consenting. Why are they consenting? They're consenting on a purely emotional level because... They see grandma, you know, they see Jesus, they see their mother, their long lost mother, you know, their dog, whatever. And they follow them through. And as soon as you follow them through, you've consented to the process. Thus, you are now under adverse uh, uh, control. You, you, you just allowed them adverse possession. Legally. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You agreed to have your car possessed when you bought the car, if you read right, the contract. Exactly. Uh, that always delighted me how people complain about having their cars possessed. But, um, yeah, you, you, you basically have, there again, some clause that's allowing this to transpire. Right, so they, they go through that, and, and then what, what I really found when I started talking about here was how the researchers weren't understanding when these, uh, after they went through the past life review and they met their soul greeters, if you, if you go through this and I, and I do step it out in the book that they meet the soul greeter and the soul greeter tells them they can stay there forever. And then they start going through these soul classes. And then, and I did find some of the, the, uh, the regression, uh, uh, scientists basically, asking, well, what, you know, what are you learning in the soul classes? But amazingly, that's blocked. They, they will never, they have never, to my knowledge, answered what a topic is or what they're being taught in these alleged soul classes. And then you start seeing from these past life regression subjects that uh, sometime after the soul classes or during the soul classes, the soul guide starts nudging them, uh, you know, that they should go back. They should think about returning. That he's asking me to return because I, based on the soul, on the, on the past life review, uh, this information is data, which may be true or untrue. Who knows? Uh, it may be falsified information. It might be highly embellished information. Um, who knows what your soul actually remembers? Uh, when it's up there, because that's another a very important point to point out here before I go on, that 
and again, this to me is another proof of the system, not only a proof of the system, but proof that it is not the creator's system. Because when your soul flies, the only data that your soul remembers, okay, is what's needed to get you in. That's it. It doesn't, if, if, it, if it remembered anything else, it wouldn't need a past life review, would it? Not at they could all. Just sit, they could just sit down at a table like a ball, like you're being interrogated by the cops, and say, "Hey, you remember this? Remember that? Remember this? Remember that? Yeah, wasn't good. You should think about going back and helping this guy because this is what you did, and this is what you did. All right, and that's what they do. They, they, they. You can see from from what these people are saying that they're utilizing the data from this that was extracted, whether it's real or not from this past life review later on after they tell them they could stay forever which i distinctly you know recall many of them saying or most of them saying that then you can start seeing the pattern they're prodded slowly prodded with guilt in a, in a guilty way with these by these soul greeters and it seems like after a little while who knows how long that they're prodded, then they meet the Council of Elders, which tells them the same thing in a more authoritative way, that they should return. And then, uh, you know, of, of course, uh, after that, everyone returns. No one gets to stay. And, uh, but what I, what I, <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make with this, I want to go home statement, which really popped at me, was that, A, the, the past life regression <clears throat> guys, uh, scientists didn't understand what they were saying. So, one of them was asking, well, what do you mean you want to go home? Do you want to come back to Earth? He, he, he wasn't understanding. And, and the subjects keep reiterating, I want to go home. I want to go home in a very lamenting way, lamentatious way. So this, this you know, I caught immediately. Um, they, from what I can tell from reading this stuff and, and listening to uh, some of the videos, that they did not understand it. Um, they, I think they didn't understand it because this is where, <clears throat> this is exactly why the science and the ancient knowledge has to be correlated, has to come together uh, to gain a far clearer understanding of, of all these events, of science and everything. I mean, it, th that's the key here, that both of these have to come together, which is why the book is the way it is, is because they do have to come together to paint the whole picture because there's two sides. The religious people will believe the religious stuff, but they won't believe the science stuff. The science people will believe that and won't believe the religious stuff. So you got to put it both together and prove how it works. It's, it's, it's you know, and correlates and, and, and upholds each other, which is very powerful. And I think this is what these guys were kind of missing still. But they were asking why they want to go home. And I understood it, or I feel I understood it immediately because the soul – you know, the soul knows its way home. The soul, I, I wrote that in, in the book as well, that they're expressing, the, the, the souls are expressing this request, and it's a very specific request, and they're expressing it for a very real reason, because they know who their creator is, they know who their father is, and they know where their home is. In that soul condition, you know, you're remembering, you're, you have the full knowledge of the ancients, you have the full knowledge. I don't care. I don't know how old you are. Maybe you're a million years old. Maybe you're. Maybe there's. You can't even number it. Who knows? But you don't have access to that memory now. But when you're in that condition, and I'm sure to some extent they are limiting that again through technology while the soul is there. Somehow, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like a cell jammer. You know, they're they're. Somehow, I'm sure they're limiting it, but that's. But you do have a large amount of these uh, past life regression subjects just stating that they want to go home, and I think that was. I thought that I just was like, wow, that is. What, what the hell is that? That is yeah, off the yeah. hook, you know. And then, but I understood it. It's because the soul knows. The soul was there, and it was there just long enough to start understanding that that wasn't it. They were not home yet. That was fake. That's why their curriculum is to make you feel a certain way and to make you believe you could stay there forever and then slowly, slowly guilt you into moving on. 
into yet another life because they know that their system won't hold. They, 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 you know, they, they know that the, the souls are going to quickly perceive the thin veil of subterfuge, you know, uh, and they're going to they're going to figure it out. And and I don't know how that helps you when you're there or if it could at all. But that's what I see with that. I found that to be a, a very amazing thing that. You know, so all everything that the souls are feeling is coming from the, the original source and not from these archons. So they're false heaven charade, you know, and and it is, you know, this whatever this resurrection ship or whatever it is, um, is is maybe it's another hologram. I mean, who, who knows? Uh, you know, it, well, obviously it would have to be another hologram, matter-based hologram to some degree, uh, but they're. It kind, of, it kind of reminds me, you know, of of how uh, I think I put in a book uh, talking about how Yeshua called those pro, uh, those Pharisees uh, whitewashed tombstones. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, it that the false heaven construct, you know, outwardly gives the appearance of heaven, and you know, and how it expresses it, and you experience it, and and all that, but it really has no righteous substance, and that's what these souls are eventually intuiting. That it, it has no righteous subject uh, substance, and 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 you know once they figure that out, they start lamenting that they want to go home, and that's what these researchers are hearing and not understanding at all what what they're saying, and it's uh, <laughs> unfortunately for them they already consented by that time to another cycle of imprisonment, you know, so uh, it's it's just it's it's a very unfortunate and uh, uh, divisive system you know so far but uh i mean so you know basically to recap it uh what you're seeing here is is that when we assimilate these things uh in life uh in all the systems on earth the narrative systems on earth they're uh, set into place to control our thoughts and our consciousness and our unconsciousness and, and create intentions so that we can create experiences here for them uh, negative experiences that they want us to create so that we have more negative experience to create more energy, probably, or what it looks like for them, and, uh, you know, causing our physical circumstances here to exist. And then later, these narrative paths are are, are used to control the soul's intentions individually and cumulatively, you know, uh, to make these experiences here. And... Uh, and they do it all without stripping free will. So, but then when you go up there, all those experiences are are are, are, are pulled out, stripped out, and then uh, utilized against you uh, when you're there to to basically fake you into a, another round of of uh, death and destruction uh, down here. So it's it's a it's a pretty uh, sick and perpetuated system. Like what do we to what do we attribute the white? process i mean what's being wiped the mind the soul what is the recorder of all this and and i have some theories about this but what do you what do you speculate in terms of how this this wiping occurs and what is the locus of the memory that theoretically we would have you know the ability to retrieve which would go back you know however far back the soul journeys are in in the in this in this matrix construct. Well, you know, I think you have you have two you have two mechanisms here, right? You have the soul, you have the body, you have the physicality. Um, and you know what? If if you if you want to understand this a little better, uh, I think I have it listed on my blog site. Another <clears throat> another great guy, uh, just a great just a great person, but uh, he's just a super smart. A scientist, one of the world, top in the world, uh, Dr. Um, Goswami. Uh, right. Emmett, Emmett yes, Goswami. Emmett Goswami. Yeah. yeah, so he has, um, oh, which book? Well, he has two really great books on the soul. Uh, I would say read both of them. Uh, but he goes into pretty good detail about how, uh, in a scientific, a very heavy scientific level, but he's pretty good at. I'm not going to say dumbing it down, but, but making it easy to, for most people to understand. To, uh, you'll have to read it a few times probably. But um, 
on that, on <clears throat> on this all how science also has shown, and I and I do quote him as well in my book, and uh, lead people to him in, in my book as well. So yeah, this is the book um, Quantum Creativity. Just uh, that's phys a, physics yeah, that's of the, the soul. One, uh, yeah, the um, the what's the other one? I can't remember the uh, physics of the Amy soul. Other. Yeah, physics of the soul. Yeah. That's that that yeah. that's the probably the one people should jump on if they're going to read one. Just one of his books. So, um, but you, I think you have two. What, what it shows here is you have, uh, you know, two mechanisms. You have the soul, which which uploads and contains forever uh, all, all of its experiences, and and. You, which, which, in under best circumstances, under the original circumstances that we were here, uh, you would you would remember everything. You would know all the understanding of the of, of the creation of the of everything. I'm not going to say the universe, because, uh, but you know of everything. And um, then you have uh, the addition of the physicality. And as you know, in the book, I hypothesize deeply uh, and show some proof, some scientific proofs that bolster the hypothesis that this body was specifically designed in, in a, even, even though it has the ability uh, to be a much higher line version of itself, uh, all of uh, 90 some odd percent or whatever of those codons have been switched off. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Which science proof. So uh, those codons have been sh switched off, giving us this body, which is the very baseline body. Now, I'm not saying that the body was designed originally to be utilized by the creator. I don't believe that at all. I believe that we were uh, light body entities, possibly, you know, most likely plasma based light. Yeah, that's entities. what I believe. Yep. And, you know, and yes, could we look like this or could we look like that? Probably. Um, I believe even Yeshua in the New Testament, I've heard where he talks about that type of thing, that, that you'll be changed back and it be able to go here and there and instantly and, and this and that. So well, I and think that's what... For people who want to want to look at a different perspective on this, on the offplanetradio.com website, there's an interview that I have up with a physician from the UK who goes into the Shroud of Turin and the physics behind that. And even if you don't believe what the Shroud represents, he goes into the physics of this whole thing, the idea of transformation into light and the idea of a, a, a resurrection that is a basically photonically based rather than this blood and skin Frankenstein thing that most people imagine when we're talking about resurrection. So... That's over there um, on the on the radio site. If anybody wants to go look at look at that, right. So um, I think uh, the way I was showing the hypothesis in, in the book and how I believe it to be is that the body, as I call the Trinity Six uh, construct is constructed in such a way that, you know, yes, it, it is an amazing thing if it's kept correctly, if it's not polluted the way it's been polluted over so long a time, if there's, you know, all these other, it, it, it can sustain a life for a longer period of time, whatever, probably if the soul was allowed to interact with the body at a much higher level, the body might even stay alive forever. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what the light body was. Maybe the light body would absorb it. Who knows? But this body, I believe, is the firewall. It it is the sponge and it is the firewall. It it is it is the crossing point that allows the intake of the narratives to be assimilated and then to be lived to also uh, be assimilated and, and stored and then uploaded through our DNA, through that 90% of DLA, DNA, like I said, that the uh, that they said was junk DNA, which is not, and 
uh, it is, is recorded and then uploaded to the soul. The soul then has that memory forever, for good or bad. Now, if those memories are based on a system of false narratives that are consistently evil, which they are, uh, consistently destructive, evil, and every other form uh, for the most part, then that is what the soul is being polluted with on a consistent basis. Uh, if now you add to that the absolute worst thing you can do is then upload uh, the, the consuming of death from the destruction of other souls in uh, their own levels of concentration camps known as, you know, farming and, and uh, meat uh, production and things like that, that uh, these, again, are other souls, just like yourself, which are being tormented on different levels, uh, much higher levels, and uh, that, uh, that DNA is sucking in all of that memory, transposing it to that soul, and it's also strewn throughout the physicality of that body, which now you're taking in. Uh, that narrative is, is the ultimate narrative that they use. All the other narratives are, much, are very sub to that one. That is the ultimate one. And, and as I've said many times, that I don't care if some uh, seemingly benevolent New World Order person takes over this world and stops all wars and figures out a way to feed everyone and no one is, is, is starving and everyone has money and it seems like utopia, I absolutely will guarantee beyond any doubt that the only narrative that will not ever end is that one is the destruction of animals for consumption of food. That one will never end because that one is the one that keeps you locked. And nobody knows it. And so with that, you have all this influx into the physicality, which is then uploaded into the soul, polluting the soul, and then, as I just explained, uh, pulled out, uh, data pulled out as your soul moves through their system to be utilized in various ways to usher you back into the system again. So, uh, you know, I think it's, like, to answer your question, I think it's both. I think it's the, the soul and the body. And the body, I believe, uh, is not only, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's the intersection. Uh, in other words, it's, it's all the narratives coming into it being assimilated so that the soul, which is a creative entity, uh, automatically creative entity, it can't, be uncreative. It can only be creative. They know this. So they stick it in a vessel, which then they can fill with narratives that they control so that the creative entity, which cannot be uncreative, in other words, the faucet that can't be turned off, uh, is pulling in uh, pollution and then putting out pollution. And then as we do this collectively, that pollution becomes our reality over a growing period. Thankfully, in this creation, it's a very slow process, 186,000 miles per second. So it's, it's a slow process. In other words, when I think it, it doesn't become reality in front of me instantly. God forbid if that happened here in our state. Right. There's a delay effect. Basically, we cannot do instantaneous manif manifestation. Right. So that that uh, that fail safe uh, was obviously put in place sometime after the beginning, after we decided to go this way. In other words, you know, so before we were probably able uh, to be trusted with that. Um, again, I'll have to go back. Amazingly, I mean, I just can't pull this out of the Old Testament with the prophets. You have to keep going back to Yeshua, uh, which. Uh, <laughs> The longer I go, the more and more I, I seem to have to uh, defer to this guy. But uh, he, he said, that, you know, 
things like uh, didn't he say something like uh, you know if, if if you knew your ability you'd be able to say to a mountain you know be gone and then come yeah. back or moving something. mountains basically yeah okay. instantaneous miracles removing the time right. delay factor which was exactly right. what he was operating in according to the stories that there right. was so, this instantaneous healing the um, the transformation of matter in terms of uh, you know, the baskets of bread and, you know, the, the, the alleged fishes and all the other things. I mean, even if these are only stories, they're portraying something of a spiritual nature. I mean, just go back to the Old Testament and look at the prophet Elisha, who was able to make iron float to the surface of water. Well, right. that's, trans that's transformation of matter right there. Yeah, it, it, exactly. He's, he's, and, you know, it's so when I look at this, that's what I think it is. It's, it's a dual feature. Uh, it's, it's not memory just from your soul end of it. It's not memory just from your physical end of it. It's both. It's one uh, adversely contributing to the other uh, so that on the back side, the other system has the information it needs to uh recycle uh the soul and and that's really what it's all about just to recycle the soul and put it back and start generating power again and and uh, you know no different than when you take your double a's and you put them in the, in the, your recharger it's uh, uh basically that simple and 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 uh, the system of narratives is there to 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 fill our lives with the to assimilate the, the negativity which then trans is transmitted through DNA, which has been specifically designed to transmit that uh, high points and low points of a life through to the soul, and and the narratives are there to guarantee that the high and low points are generally high and low, all negative, and and uh, for the most part. And I know a lot of people say, well, you know, my life's not very negative. I have a lot of good times. But you think you do. You, you think you do because you've been program to believe that uh, this level of this or that is positive or or happy or fun okay but there there's still a lot of other narratives around that just like just like last week uh, two weeks ago when you brought up about how the people uh, by you go to their their church and you know they're all going in there thinking that that's a, a highly positive of course uh, they are yeah a highly positive experience with a positive result, right? And they and they all go in there, and that's what they believe. But they all believe that, but it's not. It's not a highly positive. It's actually a very negative uh, situation. And then to prove it, when they come out, what do they do? They go. You said they go right across the street to the steakhouse and consume death. <laughs> yeah. So, well, well, and even just, you know, we'll go here for a second. Um, even back when I was in the church, I was really bothered by the whole communion aspect, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, we were consuming symbols there that I don't know if there's a transmutation process. I don't know if this was a symbol of conversion, but I was always bothered by the vampiric cannibalistic component of Christian communion, which obviously came from Rome. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that, you know, they were consuming meat at the, at the Passover dinner. It looks to me like they injected something that's actually kind of grisly when you think about it. I mean, even as a kid, <clears throat> because we weren't allowed to receive communion in, in the church that I grew up in until we were 12 years old and confirmed, you know, you've got to go through the gatekeepers to even get to that part of it. This, this idea of... You know, they hand you the wafer, they hand you the grape juice or the wine or whatever they're giving you. And they go, this is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ is shed for your sins. And you're going, well, gosh, I'm only, you know, 11, 12 years old. I haven't sinned that much. And, and really now I've got to drink blood and eat a body. I mean, even built into all of this, we see the matrix symbolism that kind of courses through the whole religious system. Yeah, and what's hysterical about it is, to me, from my point of view, always from when I was a kid, hearing this, which appalled me, you know, I, I, 
I couldn't believe that because I thought, well, aren't these people supposed to be some kind of offshoot from the Hebrew culture, the Judaism at least? You know, wasn't Jesus uh, Hebrew? You know, so in our, even in that, even in Judaism, okay, which you know what I think of most of that. Uh, yeah, uh, I understand, uh, yep. Uh, of religion, that that even in that, uh, originally, okay, now of course they, they changed things so that, uh, you know, they sidetracked a little bit, but uh, even in that, uh, you can't consume blood, and you cannibalism is really out, <laughs> big time, right. you know, and no man can, uh, can atone for another man's sin. That is loud and clear. That's loud and clear in the Hebrew culture. Forget Judaism. No man can, can atone for another man's sin. I don't care what title you put on him or what you call him. And I, yeah. I know that, well, he was God. No, he, okay, that's what we're going to separate big time. He, there's no way he is the creator, manifested himself into a, a man's body. That is, that is insanity, because you can go back into all, all, all the way to Babylon and find the same trinity, the same... Oh, Man, exactly. God. Yeah, absolutely, Shamil. Yeah. So, so see, that's, that's one part of how I work and how I've always worked or how I was taught to work. I mean, I didn't make it up. How I was taught to work was go back, and if you can find, uh, if you're telling me ABA is uh, from God, this particular precept A is from God, it's absolutely from God. And I go back and I go, oh, well, the Egyptians did it. Babylonian one did it. Uh, Sumerians did it. Can't be from God. See, because you're telling me here it was originated here. In this text, from this God. Again, which God, right? But uh, So that's what, how I work. I, you know, I call it the oldest bone. I, I find the oldest bone, and that has to be the truth until I find an older bone, which is, you know, I usually go back far enough where there aren't any others, because either they don't exist or they've been hidden, and neither is my fault. So uh, in, until I'm, I have access to even older stuff, which I have in the past have, have had access to stuff that most scholars have not even had access to. So, right, yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of it I write about, but I don't give the details about because I'd like to continue writing and, and, and teaching. So, And breathing uh, and walking up. <laughs> yes, yes. I get that. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's, they're not. So my point was that the, when they went to church, it was not the positive experience that they believed it was because there's a lot of uh, peripheral negativity that either before it or after it. So, you know, a lot of people will think I'm, 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 I'm dealing negativity uh, by, by telling them that virtually every narrative that exists on many different and various levels is negative. Even the ones that you believe are positive are negative. You know, I mean, it wasn't too long ago, it wasn't that long ago, even when something as simple as one day uh, my wife was watching something, um, I believe it was an infomercial that had come on about makeup. And they said something, I wasn't really listening, but they said something in the infomercial that made her just something in her click. And she said, well, why did they say that this makeup uh, was... Cruelty-free. Yeah, or They weren't like doing that. animal <laughs> testing. They weren't testing. They, they weren't putting lipstick on a pig is what they were telling you, basically. And, 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 and then so she was like, what does that mean? And, and, and I said, well, you realize that... See, I, I never even thought that tell her i thought you know it's just i'm just not paying attention to every detail of everyone's life you know but she i told her i said did you realize that women's makeup is largely derived from some animal dead animal source somewhere right. something along the line had to die to get you to put that crap That's on exactly your face. right everything from your perfume which is based on the uh, effluvia of a whale to um all of these different um Makeup basis, which, which is animal collagen. Right, exactly, and and uh, that's that's exactly right. And 
And that, that's what I told her. And then she went on this big uh, thing, and she started researching it and everything. So now she's sort of got other makeup that's totally uh, not based on any animal, you know, vegan uh, makeup. Not not that she even needs much, and I always tell her she doesn't need any, but you know, she it's just what they do. So uh, she's less, and she uses less of it now, But and it is more expensive, but she doesn't use that much of it. And and uh, so she went to that, and and I mean it's you know it's uh, it's an ongoing process you know for everyone, uh, and uh, to to rid your lives of that. But but this is this is what we're talking about. So all those narratives, uh, all the narratives you know, uh, from top to bottom, you really have to sit back and uh, take an accounting, and 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 look at your whole life, and and then after you're done with yours, then you you know you got to look at everyone's around you who's who's directly around you and, and in, uh, inflicting their beliefs and narratives on you as well. And and this is where the separation comes because it's so funny. I think I, I wrote this uh, in my first book, The Land of Meat and Honey, where, again, I found myself aligning my ideas with something Yeshua said, uh, which I have, I have to admit at the beginning kind of bothered me years ago because – because, you know, to me, he personified Christianity. But then somebody who was wise told me, no, he personified what you teach. Christianity changed what they believe and what he is today. So then I began to look at him differently and, and why I allow uh you know, myself to, to go back to, because so, so many things he said were so incredibly wise when you understand what context he was speaking in. And that's what Christianity has changed or, or someone has changed the context of what he was teaching and, and, and talking about. But I, I, uh, at that time I, I brought up in, I think the first book that, um, uh, I lost my train of thought here. He was, um, we were, we was talking about oh man I totally lost my train of thought where I was going sorry about that <laughs> yeah and unfortunately I must have had a memory wipe there we just we just experienced yeah. a momentary well, memory I, I wipe they, I think they could do it real time as well oh, they, they do. could just they do. Yeah. And, and suck it right out of your head but yeah. but uh, in in the first book I was telling people that you know, what he believed and, and what, what he was really teaching and uh, what I believed he was really teaching anyway, because a lot of it I can't really prove. I can only say that, look, this is what the Hebrew culture believes. This is what the Hebrew culture said. This is what the Hebrew said. And this is what Hebrew speaks like. So if he said this, this is not what he said, you know. And and uh, I was going into something and, uh, oh, oh, my God, dude, I'm so sorry. I, I totally, it totally just left left me but um you know i'm sure it'll pop right back in my head in the middle of something else we're about to say uh so i'll I'll just jump back in at that point but uh the bottom line is that these narratives are 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 all mostly uh very negative and and we really have to uh, start learning to assimilate uh something else uh, uh, you know because you know here's something that people don't understand and, and they they really do need to understand because hey you don't know when you're going to die and you're already way behind uh you're way behind it, it, it you know 20 years behind 50 years behind whatever you're way behind so you you ha- you have lived life to the point where you are and you have assimilated so much bad stuff stuff that you didn't even know was bad You've assimilated so much of it that you don't even realize what what's going to be used against you. So if you started today, you started today, you said, you know what, I believe what that guy's saying. That I, I read that guy's first book. I read his second book. He is spot on. I believe what he's saying. I am starting this this life today. I'm, I'm going into the everlasting agreement as as has been as has been shown. I'm going to research it some more to make sure this guy's not full of shit. I'm gonna you know I'm I'm gonna go through this and I'm going to do this because it just seems right. Because you know what? I mean, what am I telling you? I'm telling you to stop killing everything. Okay. So really, if I'm telling you to stop being part of total destruction, uh, 
what's your argument other than something uh, that resembles a sociopath? There's no argument no. to it. No. You know, so, I mean, even if I'm completely wrong, at least what I'm telling you at, at the core, you know, if, if the periphery is, is uh, circumstantial, what I'm telling you at the core is absolute. There's no argument. So if you do that today and you start today, uh, you have a lot of work to do. You have to work daily to because it's not – a lot of people like, oh, yeah, I read your book, and I'm, I'm, I'm vegetarian now, and, I'm, and, I, and I feel better and all this. You know, and that's great. That's great that you're on the way, but there's still a lot of shit in there. And I have to use that word, I'm sorry, because that's what it is. That, yep. that needs, that it's still there. Uh, it's still there, and, and it can be used against you. Once you separate stuff that you thought was gone is going to be used against you because when, when you're separated from your body and you don't have those memories any longer, because as I say, when you go through the past life experience stuff and, and near death experience, stuff, uh, these people in, in, in the way I break down the out of body experiences, uh, in the book, there's two, possibly three, this very distinct kinds that I've been able to identify. The very few who leave their bodies and go directly back to the creator, the true creator, no love tunnel of light, no light, no soul greeter, no trumpets, nothing, right back. And they're speaking directly to the creator. Those people have their memory. They remember where they came from. They remember where they lived. They remember their name. They remember they have children back there, all right? And they're, a lot of times they're given a choice from the ones I've seen. My friend Michelle is one of them. Okay, so, and, 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 and her experience, which is incredible, is in the book. So that's that type. But the other type, which is the majority type, which is going through the fall system, see, they it doesn't seem like, the soul has direct, it seems like something must be, probably something technological, is blocking the soul's ability to extract the depth of their memories. It would have to be, because if that soul separates from body and instantly remembers everything from the beginning of its existence, well, then they'd have a big problem. Yeah, they, I've thought that never, as well, yeah. They'd never get them into the tunnel. They'd never, they, they would be kicking the soul greeter right now. You know what? You know, so they'd be, yeah, they'd be gone. They, they'd be, I don't know, they'd be flying around wherever they are, but they wouldn't be going in there. So that'd be very problematic. So it, it does stand to reason that what I'm seeing is probably true, that they're, they're, they don't have access to those memories. They, and, but the memories, the very clear and specific memories that they're all talking about all the time seem to be very specific, that, that they remember that person they're seeing, all right, and they, and, they, and they remember just enough to get them in, and, and that's what I kept seeing, and that's when I knew that's where the consent, that's where the initial consent is, that they allow you to have just enough memory as you're coming, their technology sucks out the assimilated information, collates it, chooses what it needs, projects it, and you come in, you consent, because it just uses, all right? And, and I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, even myself, all right? Because I, I, I do a lot of deep thinking on these subjects, as people might imagine. And I think to myself, well, okay, so I've been doing this for many years. I've, I've been calling BS on, on, you know, everything since just about I'm seven years old. So <laughs> what, you know, what, what? What do I have in me? What do I have in me? I even pray about what do I have in me that can be used against me in, in those circumstances. I've assimilated everything that I've learned that I, that I know to be true. I've assimilated it to a core. And that's what I'm saying to people. If they're starting today, if they're starting tomorrow, if they started two months ago, you're way behind. You, it's not just about belief. It's not just about making the change today. It's about 
thoroughly convincing yourself every day, thinking on these matters, because you have to remember you've convinced yourself and you've thought about all these matters to the nth degree for 30, 40, 50, 70 years. And that's a lot. That's a lot of in-depth, uh, you know, uh, propaganda that, that's been really uh, driven in. So that's what you're trying to get rid of. And I do believe you can get, you get rid of it quickly, but it really has, you really have to be cognizant of the fact that you have to be thinking about it constantly. You have to, you know, that's where, and I think that's what we were talking about last time, prayer and what prayer is, and it's a frequency, it's a this mm-hmm. and that. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. You know what else it is? It, you know, any of you have to do it five times. Why do you think they, the, the false god made the Muslims do it three times a day, five times a day, whatever? The Jews do it, did it three times a day with their fault, with, with martyr, and uh, the other, uh, the same guy, made the other guys do it five times a day. Why? Because that's, that's he's, he's force-feeding that assimilation. He's, he's causing them to, to kneel down five times a day and reiterate the same BS and, and, and to just cause the influx, constant spiraling influx of that same BS. Over and over and over, five times a day. Okay, I mean, he was really serious about them wanting to be completely and thoroughly assimilated. All right? And, I mean, like the Borg level. So so this is, this is what you have to understand. It's very important that people understand this, that you have assimilated stuff that you don't, weren't even aware of. The death narrative, the destruction narrative, the news narratives, you name it. You have you have you have assimilated. You've let it in for a long time. Now, even if you're going to make this change today, you have to do the opposite. You have to do the same thing with new information. That's why I say in a book, what you're doing. Here's what the goal is. The goal is to assimilate a new narrative. It's a very simple narrative, so it's easy to assimilate assimilate a lot of it at a lot a lot of it at one time and continue assimilating it constantly a lot a lot a lot over and over so every day every minute every hour you can do it with, with, without just just become it that's what you're trying to do you're trying to become it whereas before you just assimilated a lot of stuff you didn't, you became it over time uh, no just the way water becomes muddy over time because uh influx of dirty water from you know one of the other rivers in pennsylvania so uh, going into the other one so that happens over time uh, slowly and and the whole thing becomes muddy. All right. So now you're just clearing that out, um, and it's not metaphysical. It's it's just uh, that it's it's a thought process. It's a belief process. It's a life process. I'm you know I'm doing this in my kitchen. I'm doing this when I go out. I'm doing this. I'm I'm talking about to someone. I'm 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 living this. And the reason why is because what you're trying to do is not only assimilate a new narrative, the correct narrative, right, the, the true narrative, a righteous narrative, but you're, what you're doing is now you're making your soul incompatible. That's the goal. That's what everyone should hear here, that everything in this book, everything we've been talking about in, in all this series so far, is the goal is to make your soul incompatible so that when it leaves, it just goes back to the original creator. Because the others won't even see it. They won't, they won't, even if they see it, they won't be able to lure it. They won't be able to attract it. They won't even be able to point their little ray guns at it, whatever they're doing. Be- because it, you have become incompatible. I mean, if that is the best and biggest term that anyone could take away from this entire series, is to become incompatible. Your, your soul needs to become incompatible. And I, and I say this because even myself, I think, you know, what, what could possibly be used against me if, if, if somehow even I go up there after teaching this all lifetime, you know, even I go up there and, and they have uh, mechanisms that doesn't allow you to remember any of the good stuff somehow. Now, I don't particularly believe that. I, I don't. But, what you know, I have to leave room for it, you know, because I don't know everything. So I, you know, I have to leave room for it. But but the the logical side of me says, the creator did not continually drop in, reiterate the same narrative of teshuva, which 
which means in Hebrew to return. He did not drop in the same narrative, teaching his souls how to return. Has to be because free will has to reign. So you You can't can't just have have one side, side, you have to have have both sides. sides. So So he he keeps keeps dropping dropping in from person person to person, person, here and there, whether it was Enoch, whether it was Noah, whether it was later uh, Abraham, whether it was later Moshe, and then it was later Yeshua, and then later someone else, and then maybe later me, I don't know, but here's what you have. You have this narrative being dropped in every couple thousand years. And it teaches through the prophets that you have to return. And it teaches you how to return. Right? Now, it's not very clear when you read the books because why? The other side is working diligently. And they have redacted, they have, uh, you know, they've switched things around, they've put things from the front to back, they, they've changed things. So it's a lot more difficult. But see, the narrative was dropped in, and it's not allowed to be removed, because removing it completely would negate free will completely, which would then end this game in a nanosecond for them. And they know this. That's why through uh, out of all earthly experiences and throughout all this false heaven experience, consent is key. Because if these guys didn't need consent, believe me, we would have all been slaves without any memory of anything in some hideous way a long, 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 long time ago. So the fact is consent is key. It happens here on earth. You just saw it happen with an election. All right, now, we don't know what's going to happen with that, but the bottom line is a whole lot of people said, you know what, screw this. I don't consent to that crap anymore. And this guy looks like, you know, he's going to go the other way. So I'm going to consent to this for now. And then it went the other way. So you see it uh, terrestrially, and you see it played out in their false heaven systems. And what I bring up is that even for myself, I've pondered this, and I've prayed about it, and I thought... And then one day it hit me, yes, you do. You do have something in you, okay, that you've shown people and you've taught here and there and you've led people to from from time to time years ago uh, about Moses. And I thought about it, so that's right. See, years ago I I was very enamored uh, by, uh, in the Cairo Museum, how they have uh, the, the statue of Moshe. Right and what he looks like and and his likeness and and everything like that mm-hmm. and uh you know and I was I remember I looked at that guy and and uh, and, I, and I thought wow you know he uh, he looks like he could have been one of my relatives when, when you look at his face because his face does not look nor does mine look what we would call Ashkenazic today <clears throat> the the Shalonite look. That Eastern European look. It's not yeah. the same. Right, right. So, um, I know I've held that. I know I've taught people, shown people, look, look at this, look. Moses did exist. Here's the, why would they build giant, you know, 30 foot statues of a guy that didn't exist and, and, and all this. <clears throat> and this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I even put this, I believe, uh, mentioned this in my Asher Coda. And so then I thought, well, there you go. Uh, it was kind of hidden. I didn't think of it too often, but there it is. That's something that if I don't have the memory, if something goes wrong, and and I don't know, uh, they really hate me, maybe, and they go out of their way uh, to somehow suck me back in. I, I hope and I, I, I personally believe that's not possible, but, you know, you got to leave room for it. So uh, you, have to, you have to look at both sides. So I thought, well, that's something I have to extract. That, uh, you know, doesn't matter what, uh, what that guy looked like or if that was even him, uh, because the only thing I have to key on is uh, that I'm a portion of the Creator and uh, that I'm going directly back to Him. And that's something that I have to, you know, constantly think about and work on and, and project in my own self and, and, and make it become root rather than uh, just a surface uh, surfacing. I think that's what I'm trying to say. So that is definitely something that everybody has to work on, you know, because um, these archons, I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole, uh, that's the whole play. I, I, 
I don't know if you, you ever saw this, um, but a couple of years ago, I think a friend, a friend of mine who uh, will get a kick out of this, his name is Mark. Uh, hmm. Yeah, Mark uh, sent me a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, uh, a clip of a Star Trek um, TV show. Um, it wasn't Star Trek Next Generation. It was one after that where the captain was that woman, Janeway. It oh, yes. Was, uh, a, a woman. I think her name was Jane, Janeway, I think it was. And, and, um, and, and if you go look on YouTube, it's there. And I think if you look up Star Trek uh, TV show and write the word Archons, I, yes. I think of memory. I think of memory serves. It was called the Archons, which blew my mind right right out of the water. It blew my mind when I saw it. And what was amazing was, uh, and and everybody should go check that out on YouTube because believe me, everything I'm saying, everything that's in this book is played out. <coughs> yes. And and it's because I, I believe at that time I was I was probably I was still writing the book and. And uh, Mark is one of the people that I have sent uh, chapters back and forth and go back and forth uh, because we're very like-minded and, and he's really great to bounce things off of. And so he, that's probably why he sent it to me. And what it was was uh, that they were on some planet and the captain, Janeway, uh, got struck down by something and she was on the verge of death. And uh, the three guys on the planet, you know, were trying to, you know, get her back to the ship or trying to revive her. And while she was laying down here on the planet, it cuts to another scene where she's actually on her ship talking to her father, who was an admiral in uh, the Federation fleet. And she's talking to her father and the father is explaining to her. Uh, the father was not her father. Of course it was the, it was the Archon soul greeter. This actually goes back. This actually goes back to the original series as well. Um, episode twenty-two of the original Star Trek, which was the one with Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner, was called "The Return of the Archons." Anybody can oh, look really? that up. Yes, I, I yes. Never thought, I'll, I'll, was that twenty-two? You said episode twenty-two. I just looked it up. "The Return of the Archons." You can get it on. Um, you can get it on Amazon in VHS format, folks. So. Uh, bust out that VCR once again. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, uh, no, this was a recurrent theme. Gene Roddenberry knew this stuff. Roddenberry was yep. part of a group called the Nine, which were a group of channelers. They knew all this stuff. This is all baked into our entertainment everywhere. You know, it's not lost on me that you, you brought up um, Battlestar Galactica earlier because I think my wife just said to me something the other day about Going back and looking at that again because something something popped up. These entertainment franchises are kind of you know they drop a little bit of truth in to the entertainment. It's kind of interesting how that works. Yeah, uh, regarding the Battlestar Galactic, I'll, I'll jump right back on what I was saying. But yeah, regarding that, uh, uh, years ago, I mean, I remember when I was much younger, I watched the original version stuff, and there's not much to that that no. I remember, but. But the second one in the 90s, yeah. Next that, generation. Series, that series, I, I, uh, I, it was free on Amazon, I believe, or maybe Netflix. And, you know, uh, usually when I sit down la later at night when I'm done working, I just want to veg out and watch something. So I started watching that series. Um, and... Uh, I was pretty blown away when I went through the whole series and I was like, holy crap, the stuff that is the innuendo, the stuff that is written into that series is mind blowing. And when, when you know what I know and I, and I was, and so I told my friend, uh, friend, or local friend here, uh, who doesn't generally go in for that stuff at all. I said, you have to watch this series, knowing what you know, what I know, you have to watch the series. And he kind of reluctantly did it. And about a week later, he calls me up and he says, wow, man, he goes, I am totally into this. 
he goes, this is blowing my mind. And, and you know, and, and he was going into some particulars because he was like, he was like binging it, you know, and, uh, and, and watching it. I, I was pretty shocked. I really didn't think he was going to watch it at all. But going back to the Star Trek, so, so that series is, if you can watch it, is worth watching very intently and, and, and really paying attention to the details. But uh, the Star Trek, the Archon, the later Archon, the Janeway Archon one, it was pretty amazing because the, the, the father, the Archon, who was pretending to be the father, the soul greeter, was telling her that she was going to, you know, that she was on the edge yeah. of death. And, and, I, and I just found this. The, um, it, this is, this is um, Janeway versus Archons. It's Star Trek Voyager, the series. It's called Coda. And it's episode 57 of Star Trek Voyager. Okay, there you go. Janeway versus the Archons. So, there you go. So, yeah, and and uh, he's basically standing in front of her, pretending to be her father. And uh, I remember that that, that yes. he was saying, "You, you I... just need to come with me. Just follow me." And you know this and that. And she was saying, "Well," and and she started to get a little, uh, you know, not believing for some reason. She said, so she started querying him. Uh, and and he couldn't answer the questions correctly, or or the attitude of the questions that he was the way he was answering was incorrect not what her real father would have believed in or said and that's how she outed him as an archon and he was really trying then then he moved from uh you know being benevolent uh to being uh you know uh um, trying to scare her trying to use fear to move her to come and then when he finally figured out you know that acquiesced that he wasn't going to get her. He said, we will get you. It's inevitable. You will come here. And I was like, holy crap. This, this, this is like, I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I, I never saw it before. And uh, th that, that, that just, <laughs> I was like, wow. Did, you know, this guy, Roddenberry, you know, he, he knew something. He knew a lot more than, than, uh, than, and what he's probably put on that screen, that's for sure. But this is how it works, and this is what it's all about. So it's it's really, you know, the bottom line, it's about consent, and it's about in, in, in any one lifetime uh, realigning yourself, assimilating uh, the truth narrative, the, the, the love versus destruction narrative, and... and uh, realigning yourself which which takes time it's not something that'll happen you know uh, overnight uh, so when when you when, you know and that and that's the information that they're going to try to use against you uh, so that, that's why i say the, the 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 idea the ultimate idea of what you're doing is not a new religion it's if you want to call it a religion then it's the religion of becoming incompatible uh, you know, uh, because when you look at their life review, like we were talking about before, uh, the whole, entire process, you know, it, it's a narrative. It's a narrative-based manipulation. It's designed uh, to be used to manage and control the soul's repeatable rebirth process, you know. So it, by associating and attributing guilt to the narratives that you assimilated, uh, assimilated when you're alive. Now, you're obviously, you're, like I said, you're not remembering the detail of that life until that process. So that process, that life review process, is, again, based on uh, high technology that uh, extrapolates, uh, well, extracts, uh, in, uh, you, you know, information from your soul, uh, uploads directly into whatever it is, and then shows it back shows it back to you. Now, whether it's real or whether it's uh, highly embellished <clears throat> to look very negative, again, you're not remembering it because something they have is is actually blocking you from remembering it because, like I said before, logic dictates if you could remember it, you wouldn't need the life review screen. So, you know, you really have to look at this stuff very logically. And, and so, uh, obviously the life review is there because you can't remember it. So if I can't remember, then what you're showing me on the screen, how do I know it's true? Exactly. But yeah, you know, but is. at that point, 
At, the, at that point, it doesn't matter, my friend, because you've already consented to come in, and now we have you. So, so basically, it is um, it is an interactive script writing session to create loop back into the matrix yet again and continue to be energetic food for these wraiths we call the archons. Right. It's uh. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty insidious. Yeah, it's, yeah, when you when you start like like I did in the book, when you start looking at different. You start asking questions. Who does it help? You know, who does a life for you process help? You know, consenting to entering. You know, who does it help? And and <laughs> when when you start looking at it, it helps. It helps them. It does not help you at all. And especially, uh, you know, you know, in my mind, and again, what I used in the book as an ultimate proof that this is not an original creator system. And, and again, I say this is my ultimate proof, is the fact that no one remembers anything. You're not, you know, like I said before, there's thousands of people a year, generally children under the age of 10, it seems, that do remember past lives or portions, very small portions of who they were, where they lived, who their parents were, what they looked like, you know, a few things they did. I was a pilot. I was this. I was that. Things like that. That's great. You know what? That's not telling me how the pyramids were built. That's, right, 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 it, right. Exactly. That, yes. That, that's not showing yep. me what, my, what, how to get back to my life body. That's not doing anything. That's just a private information that, that that falls under who the hell cares, you know. And it's it's interesting, but who cares? So you know, it, it, it's 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 like somebody was just telling me the other night they were they were having an argument. Their wife was having an argument with somebody else that, that, that was visiting about how old the earth was. I was like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. How, you, how small is your brain? That you're, you're you're arguing over how old the Earth is, you know. And so you know, so you do have a lot of these, these kids and and some adults that remember their past life or allegedly remember their past life. But personally, I believe the children and uh, empirically. But the, the the key is that. The past life regression people and even near-death experience people are allegedly gaining all this information. Now, the near-death experience I want to go into just a little bit because I think that's another false narrative. But the past life regression stuff, which, again, I'll consent to the fact that it could possibly be uh, somewhat manipulated in real time as it's happening as well, but I don't believe it is because the information coming back leads someone like me to prove that the whole system's fake. So I highly doubt they would do that. It's probably real information coming back. So uh, maybe what we can do is maybe what we could do is do this, Shamil, because we covered a lot of material in this in this episode, and we're kind of bumping up on a time here. Sorry, we're still in time. Uh, time is no more. Time is money. Oops, we're out of time. We're out of money. And. Um, <laughs> maybe what we can do is pick up the the near death experience and continue this on the next uh, episode because I, I, there's a lot of depth to this. There's a lot of girth to it that I, I think we can touch on and I don't want to give any of it short brush because this is the this is the core, the crux of you know a lot of what we're talking about. But if there's anything else you want to grab here in the next couple of minutes, go for it. Well, um, what was I saying? That, 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 well, basically that, uh, I guess what I was trying to get at was that the people that are regressed are saying that they're in soul classes and that they're not specifically saying that what they're learning in the soul classes, but, but in the context of the whole. Past life review, it's good if you go back to help people, to help mankind, to help the people you hurt. This is what this is what they're saying, that they're told that they should go back, and they're pushed, and they're pushed, and they're pushed until they do go back. Mm -hmm. So ostensibly, obviously, within this context, those soul classes are alleged, all right, are, are in somehow connection with the return trip back. 
Now, what I use as absolute proof in my mind, anybody can believe what they want to believe, but in my mind, based on all the information and logic, that the, the, the lack, the complete and utter missing memory when they return, whether they are kids that remember a little bit of their past life or not, <coughs> our history alone, all of human history alone, can be used as absolute proof that no one has come back with any groundbreaking, uh, illuminating, positive information uh, that has driven mankind or the souls of mankind forward in only a positive direction. N none of this has happened ever so nothing that's happening up there is real nothing that's happening up there can be proven to be remembered implemented and useful here after the fact not one thing and our history proves it so the lack of memory when we return is the ultimate proof that this is not a creator invoked system because would you do that? Well, like I wrote in the book, I mean, I think, again, I'm I, I, you know, pulling it out of uh, the Christian context, uh, you know, but, but it's, it's not just, it's not Christian, it's Hebrew. Would, if your son asked you, if your child asked you for bread, would you give him a stone? Right? So right, right. Would, yep. would, do we teach people? Uh, do, how do we teach people? We teach people through repetition. We teach them, and we repeat it, and they learn it. And we take the time and energy to teach people, to teach children, because we know how memory works, and we know that they will retain the memory, and we know that it will um, help them personally and hopefully contribute to the species, the physical species, and possibly even uh, the souls uh, going forward. That's why we do it. We don't teach people things because we know they won't remember them. That not the, the lack of memory is devastating. It's absolutely devastating. Uh, a creator who creates does not create a situation that creates the inability to create. Yeah, this is basically spiritual common core education on steroids. If you stop and think about it, if the goal was to remember, it's an abysmal failure. It sounds like a horrible process. Right. Right. It's. It, so there are certain aspects of this that I use as proof that I, I firmly believe are absolute proof that that system, that, that, that false heaven matrix resurrection station, whatever you want to call it, um, is fake. It's, it's fake. It's, it's, com it's, it's just there to recycle just as most of the ancients believed was happening, uh, whether it was the, the moon god Yah or whether it was the sun god Ra, uh, you know, or it depends, it didn't matter. It, you know, they believed that this was happening for a reason. They didn't, you know, I don't believe they just made it up. And, you know, someone told them, just like I show in, in many of the, the texts that I use uh, through, through the book, the, the ancient texts, that, that someone gave these people information that they could have not, not acquired on their own. And uh, they, just because... They didn't have the vocabulary back then to express it, uh, you know, to, to give it some real uh, depth to their expression of what they were speaking about. Uh, they did their best, and, uh, you know, then other people that didn't have a clue of what uh, these people were saying in ancient times have retranslated this stuff and pretty much destroyed it. So you have to go back to the original, look at it, and say, well, okay, th this word meant this, this word meant that, and this is what they were trying to get across, and when you correlate it back to science, forward to science or back to even more ancient things, uh, that, that's when this whole picture starts coming, coming together. you you, you got to get away from the Western translation of things because these guys made a mess of things. They, 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 they made such a mess, it's, it's not even worth reading a thing they wrote. It's, it's just not. It's, it's a giant waste of time. Pe you know, people that say to me, oh, you know, the whole Bible is the Word of God. You, you got to be kidding me. There's, there's not one 
Jew on the planet that ever truly believed that. And and on on top of that, it's at best in the in the in the as I've written and proved in my first book, at at, at the at best, it's known to be a fifty percent commentary of the original Hebrew, which was at that time completely modified. You know, <laughs> it's like come on, you know. You, you, so finding all this stuff out, this is this is a big uh, this is a big leap forward for us because you know I think. Uh, because we're being allowed to see these things now, and uh, I I hope it's because we're near the end of this thing, and and hopefully uh, we'll we'll just move forward and and the enlightenment will explode and and uh, whether police, people believe the way I'm teaching 100 percent or 50 percent or 80 percent doesn't matter because geez if you just get the core of it and and start reassimilating and and uh, make yourself uh, incompatible make your soul incompatible then what, it, there'll just be a, a mass exodus, and maybe that's what the greater exodus is. I wrote a book called The Greater Exodus, as you know, and that was my second book, which is kind of a must-read if you read the first book. And although, and I haven't said this many times to many people, but I, when I wrote that book, I was, as far as I know, since Moses, the first person to uh, publicly teach that prophecy. It's been hidden for a long time. Now, within Judaism and stuff, it's not so hidden because that's what the Passover is based on, and and, and we know this, see, but, but they don't teach it to anybody else because they don't believe the greater Exodus is for anyone else. But see, when you go into the prophets and you really – teach what it really is, it's obviously for all souls, because the, the, the reiteration of the truth of the original information of Teshuvah was dropped in, like I said, periodically through time for all souls, not for just some, not for just some special ones, so it's for all. All were created from the same source, thus all are re- required or requested to go back to return to the same source. It just makes sense. I mean, to it, it's only man that divvies it up into, into tribal factions, and only this tribe or that sector of uh, humanity or people are special or chosen. And that's what we do, but that's not what the Creator does. So this, this whole greater exodus, I've never said it, you know, on air, I don't believe, but... When I wrote it, I wrote it in such a way as it was given. It was given by the prophets, and they gave it, seemingly gave it, as a terrestrial event. But, and that's how I wrote it. And it's provable, and it's the only prophecy, the only prophecy that I know of that is 100% from beginning to end. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to wonder about what Daniel was saying here and uh, and Jesus was saying there and Isaiah might have uttered here and then throw them all together in an amalgamation of BS that you come up with because it sounds good. That's what most of the prophecies are. I mean, when I go into Daniel, it does not say what the Christians say it says. Therefore, it cannot attach to... To, to John the Revelator, the way they say it attaches. See? Right, right. Yeah, so, and I agree with you on that. And that that's that was my point so that, of departure with Christianity back low so many years ago. Right, and so that greater exodus, what I've never said before, was that it could be, uh, all right, let's say a non-terrestrial event. Yep, that's it, actually it, kind uh, of, yeah. Yeah, and to, to me personally, it makes more sense that it would be a non-terrestrial event? In other words, that yes, it might start out terrestrial, but that the exodus itself might be a mass enlightenment started by, say, 144,000 that explodes, and then the archons see it happening, but it's too late at that time, and they do something like the Great Flood, whatever, and try to destroy all of humanity, which maybe they do, and 
the but it's too late because those souls are now incompatible and whiz right by them. And they're gone. And the meek shall then inherit maybe another place or this place after it's renewed. Renewed heaven, renewed earth, renewed dome, renewed flat earth, whatever you want to call it, and, and bang. You're back in your original state, and then that revolves back into what Yeshua said, that you'll be changed in an instant, and blah, 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 blah. And maybe that's where, uh, although completely uh, adulterated, uh, maybe that's where the Christians at some point 80, 100 years ago got the idea of their, uh, what do they call it, the, the rapture. Maybe yeah, yeah. The, 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 maybe the, maybe the idea, the, the base idea of that rapture somehow was drawn out of the, 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 the much more provable understanding of the greater exodus, uh, which is the sec, known as the second exodus, the second and greater exodus. So maybe that's where that came from, too. So it, it does wrap all these things up and above. Uh, things that Yeshua said, things that the Christians incorrectly, naively believe uh, for the wrong reasons, uh, the rapture, so to say. And, uh, you know, and maybe the greater of ex Exodus is I wrote it in a terrestrial way uh, because that's how it was given. That's why I wrote it that way. And I didn't add in the extraterrestrial, not extraterrestrial, but uh, you know what I mean, the non-terrestrial uh, possibility of it in that book only because I didn't want to sound double-minded or, or lay too much on, on, on people at that time who were, you know, and still who are receiving very new information that has never been taught before to them. See, so I didn't want to, you know, uh, inundate them with, with a whole nother, you know, higher level of that. But, that, but that is a possibility and I'm saying it here. So, as people read that book, you know, just think of it that way as well. It, it could wrap right into all of this, what I'm saying. So then really, as I said before, making your soul incompatible is the ultimate focus going forward. That's it. Nothing else exists or nothing else should exist. That's it. Getting out. Getting the hell out. That, that's it. You, you consented to being here at some time in, in, previously. You don't remember it. We don't remember it. I don't remember it. Uh, you know, personally, I have a hard time believing I did, but I must have. And uh, here we are. So now we have to hear what was said and get the hell out and figure it out. And that, that's the only way. I Believe me when I tell you, I've done all the research, and I've done this for many years. I invite somebody to, to bring it to the next level because I can't see or find any more information uh, that that's credible information that locks in logically and and, and linearly uh, to to all this that that makes it any any uh, you know any, any better or or more understandable than, than I already have. So, uh, but there you go. So I guess we there can pick go. up with uh, you know we could pick up with uh, I guess the next part after like you know could be maybe uh, I don't know. I guess it would be, you know, the memory area or uh, life. Yeah, you know, we already went through life review and all that. So, like, you know, like you said, there's a lot more to this, man. You know, so the memory wipe. You... There we go. The great memory, memory wipe. wipe. Where's all the memory yeah. going? That's it. Where is it going? The memory leak. Just like your computer, it has a memory leak, and then it crashes. All right, Shmuel, that's going to wrap it up for this time for us. Um, the website, as always, is Ancient Hebrew Learning Center dot blogspot.com did i get that right yeah at least you got it right yeah yeah and and that's that's my that's I, I didn't my get it right job. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we always put links up with the show it's actually baked right into each one of the youtube videos so you have no excuse for not finding it you can find the books on amazon we are talking about the soul revolution the trinity of humanity and we'll be back in about two weeks with another show on the Triunity series. I'm Randy Moggins for Off Planet Radio. Truth is out there, it's inside you. Go look for it. 